Luma AI video answers the age-old question. Stable diffusion does stochastic parrots, async request in Java, and the usual silly collection of tweets and toots. Welcome to Tales from the Jarsat. Welcome, my name is Ken Cousin. This is my free weekly newsletter, Tales from the Jar Side. On Tales from the Jar Side, we try to help you understand what's important in AI or in, in IT this week, and what's not so important, what you can skip over. The subtitle this week, which is usually a gag if you're not aware, is I love how the earth rotates. It really makes my day. Yeah, that's a bad one, I'm sorry. Welcome fellow Jarheads to Tales from the Jar Side, the Cousin IT newsletter for the week of June 9th through 16th, 2024. This week, I taught week one of my periodic spring in three weeks course on the O'Reilly Learning Platform. I had two No Fluff Just Stuff virtual workshops, one on practical AI tools for Java developers, one on Gradle principles and practices for that one. So that was interesting. The normal statement here is that regular readers of and listeners to, and of course, video viewers of this newsletter are affectionately known as jarheads and are far more intelligent, sophisticated, and attractive than the average newsletter reader or listener or viewer. If you wish to become a jarhead, please subscribe using the button on the newsletter, or you can, you're welcome to subscribe on the YouTube channel, Tales from the Jar Side, or at talesfromthejoutube.com. Our first section is on a, an event that came out this week. There's a new tool available. Luma Labs released an AI text-to-video generator, which they call Dream Machine. If I click on the link here, you'll see an example. It just shows various events happening here. But you see it's called Dream Machine. And the idea is that you can put in a few, you put in a, either an image or some text and then it will generate five seconds of video based on that. So here I could write something like they're suggesting grazing cows move slowly across an idyllic meadow, the camera tracking alongside them in a smooth whatever. What the heck, I think I will go ahead and put in the cover of one of my books. So I'll be right back. So this is the cover to my Help Your Boss Help You book, Convert Conflict into Opportunities. And the text I'll put in is zoom in on the cover of this book as it helps you build a beneficial relationship. Now, this enhanced prompt means they're probably going to rewrite the prompt, which is fine. I just want to check it. They say that the free tier, which is what I'm on, has 10 generations a day. Paid tiers have priority in the queue and no daily limit. I certainly am not planning to pay for this. It's pricey. The one I generated yesterday is I had Dolly 3 generate an image of a chicken crossing a road. And you can see as I mouse over it, there's the video which generated. I, you're probably as confused as I am. Why is the road moving? Or is the road stationary and the, the world is moving opposite us? It just looks very strange. I will give it credit for making the chicken move like a chicken. I guess that's good. The one that I did down here, nothing moved at all. The camera panned around a little bit. And the chicken did look at the camera. I guess that was interesting. But I tried both of those yesterday when preparing the newsletter. I got to say, I like this one a little bit better. All right, let's talk about the newsletter, and then I'll come back and see what it generates in terms of the book cover. So what I said in the newsletter was that most of the video generators I've seen so far are pretty awful. The one I played with is the one from Stability AI, that's the company that makes Stable Diffusion. And their text to image generator is very good. That does an excellent job. But then when you upload an image, because theirs is not text to video, it's actually image to video, although you can add text to it. That one, I had a terrible time getting to work programmatically. And then the video it generated was so creepy, I had to go lie down. It was really bizarre. So I'm not even including in the newsletter because that would be really scary. So for Luna, as I said, I, I put in this prompt on Dolly 3 saying, generate, draw a photorealistic image of a chicken crossing a road to try to answer the old question. This is the rewritten prompt, a photorealistic picture of a chicken crossing a road. The chicken is in is mid-stride on a sunny day with a clear blue sky. The road is a two-lane asphalt road with yellow dividing lines. Yellow dividing lines. I'm not sure what motivated that. 
and there are green fields on either side of the road. In the background, there are a few trees and distant hills. The scene is peaceful and bright. So I looked at that and I showed it to my wife and I'm like, what the heck is going on? And she said, the crosswalk made it look like a country version of the Beatles' Abbey Road album cover, which, yeah, okay, although it's walking the wrong direction on that, but that made some sense. So then I had to go search for jokes that connected to the Beatles' Abbey Road. And at first I couldn't come up with anything. I said, oh, it would definitely be a cover, the related joke, right? Rim shot. But then I came up with this. Why did the chicken cross Abbey Road? Because, as in... You probably recognize the song, but I'll just put in that much. There was one gag I put in there. And I uploaded the chicken image, and we just saw the video, and I said, something in the way she moves, of course, is another pun. And, of course, here comes the sun, because look how bright that sun is on the little image there. Holy mackerel. I, I mentioned to my editor, because I'm working on a book these days on adding AI to Java, and my sense is that going from text to text, or what we normally call chat, that's pretty solid. Hallucin hallucinations aside, or what some people just call BS, if you will, text to image is about a generation behind that. It's okay. It's not great, but it's getting there. It's not horrible anymore. Dolly 3 was a huge step up from Dolly 2, that sort of thing. Text to video is a generation behind that, at least. So you get weird stuff out of it. Image to video is pretty much the same as text to video. Text to audio, that works really well. If I generate an MP3 file from my text, tends to do well on that with some pronunciation issues, but not too bad. Audio to text, the other direction, which they normally would call transcription, is fine, although I tend to have problems with technical terms and that sort of thing. But I do use a tool based on the Whisper model to generate the subtitles for the newsletter every week. So let's take a look. Oh, still generating the video. So my book is covering all of those things, or not the video. I'm doing the chat, the image generation, text-to-speech, the vision model, which is, I guess I forgot to add that, didn't I? Which is image-to-text. That's the vision model. And that's actually gotten a lot better recently, although it's got a ways to go too. And I'm covering all that and I'm leaving the video stuff alone because I just don't think it's anywhere near ready for prime time. And then one last gag was, why did the chicken cross Abbey Road? To avoid Maxwell's silver hammer. Yeah, sorry, I'll show myself out. Okay, next section. Stability AI also released another AI model for image generation, which they called Stable Diffusion 3 Medium. If I click on that, you can see here I'm at stability.ai, and this was the blog post that announced the existence of this. Let me close some stuff here. And it's their most advanced text-to-image open model yet, and on and on. And if I go to the API, Fusion 3, VRR API and applications, here's the API. And if I go to the generate part, now there's Stable Image Ultra. I tried that too although that's not what the blog post was about. So I'll just go to Stable Diffusion 3 here, and you see they have different sizes for the model. It's funny how the SD3 Large Turbo actually winds up costing less than SD3 Large, but this, the same mechanism was used to access all of them. You basically just have to send a prompt to the proper URL and put in all the right properties and you get back something decent. And they've got some examples here of what all the fields are and everything. So in the blog post, I included the following. Oh, and by the way, for the prices, say they are, they cost you $10 per thousand credits. So if you put in 10 bucks, you have a thousand credits and each medium image is only three and a half credits. The large image is six and a half and large turbo is four. So again, that's, cheaper than large, but only slightly more than medium. I don't know why. Since it's $10 per thousand credits, that works out to, basically these are just measured in cents. So four cents, three and a half cents, six and a half cents per image. I figured I could afford it. So I generated all three. The prompt I used was stochastic parrots playing chess. Stochastic parrots, of course, being the somewhat 
pejorative term used about AI tools, that they're just stochastic parrots. They've got randomness and they don't understand what they're talking about. So here was stochastic parrots playing chess on the medium model. And that one looks really nice, except for the fact that the green parrot's got some issues with one of its wings. Let me magnify that a bit. So you could really see it that something got truncated over there. I'd probably try it again, although I like the colors. If I go to the large model, this was from the large model. That actually came out pretty well until you look at the chess pieces. And there's some weird looking pieces in here, including some that are both black and white together. You can't pay much attention to that, but the parrots came out okay. And then I tried the large turbo model and it drew a, this thing, which is silly. Also, I'm not sure about the, the combination of the claw and the wing here, but it would make it easier to pick up the pieces. And again, the pieces are a little strange, but I tried it out. So I probably spent, I don't know, 10 cents on that, something like maybe 15. So at any rate, let me scroll down. And that was that section. I did say, yes, this whole example was for the birds. Okay. On another topic, I've been working on the code for the book and with Olama specifically, Olama is the tool that allows you to run large language models on your own hardware. So you download a model locally, and this has got to be some open source or what they call open weights model, and you could run it right on your own machine. And this is great because this way you're not sending any data off site. Nobody's monitoring what you're saying. You're not giving it to some cloud provider and you are limited by the power of your own hardware. The thing about Olama is it does provide a programmatic API. It's in the form of a REST request. So you can see this little sample here, which came from the Olama documentation, said, let's send a curl request to API slash generate, and here's the body in there. Model was, for example, Llama 3, and the prompt is, why is the sky blue? Now, I now know with Olama, this is missing an optional field, that optional field is called stream. And I usually set that. If you don't set it to false, the default is true. And when you get back, it's a whole series of responses streaming at you, basically one word at a time. So if you just echoed the words, it would feel like you were working on the ChatGPT website, the way it scrolls across very slowly. But that doesn't make it any faster. It just lets you know the intermediate results right away. I usually put in stream is false and that way it just gives me nothing and then gives me the complete answer. But it did occur to me that I can in fact access this programmatically and deal with it. So here's the code just to give those of you who are developers an idea. I put in a model and a prompt and I, I turned that into a, a little record I made for the text request. So here I'm using the HTTP client with an HTTP request using the new builder method set the headers appropriately with the accept header being a text slash event stream, put in a post request with that in the body. And what I get back is interesting here. I'm doing a send async, meaning yes, I am sending an asynchronous request that will return a completable future. So of lines is a body handler that will return a stream, a Java functional stream of strings. So I can use the then accept method on the completable future to access the body and for each line, if it has done is true in it, then I'm finished. But if it doesn't have done is true, then I'll map the result, each one of those lines that came back into another record and print out the word. And then this is the part where if I am done, I'll just say, yeah, I'm all finished. So that came out nice. And when I wrote the test case, let me scroll down here, I put in the test case, why didn't Frodo just fly to Mordor in the back of a giant eagle? I sent that to the Orca mini model. The Orca mini model is a really good model for testing because it is very fast. The accuracy is a little shaky, of course, because you're using a small model just for the speed. But again, it makes for a good test model. The reply I got back is here, according to the text of the Lord of the Rings, Frodo was not physically able to fly on an eagle due to his weakened condition from the ring curse, which, okay, wait a minute, he flew back. Additionally, the story, Gandalf was holding him. The story emphasizes the importance of using feet and legs to travel long distances, which is why Samwise Gamgee, Frodo's faithful companion, was sent a law ahead of him with the orders to gather supplies and meet Frodo at the Black Gate of Mortar. I don't remember that happening. Ultimately, Frodo's physical limitations and the need for caution led him to use a pack to carry his supplies instead of flying on an eagle. 
that's dangerously close to a hallucination. I don't know if that's true or if it's just making that up. I'd have to do a little bit more digging in. The point is, though, I got all the answers out of it. What, what I didn't emphasize in the code up here is that each time I got back a word, I did a print, not a print line. I did a print line at the end, say, yeah, I'm all finished. So even though these words came back asynchronously, I got one word at a time, and it just, this is all one word, one line, rather, with word wrap turned on in the output. So, again, I don't know if I'd buy it, but it, the code worked, and that's what I was trying to demonstrate. Okay, the video is still processing, so there must be a big demand going on. Let's move on to our tweets and toots. Okay, this one is a Venn diagram with blockchain on the left and Gen AI on the right and a senior software engineer at the bottom. The blockchain one is still searching for a use case. Gen AI is still searching for a business model. Senior software engineer is still searching for a semicolon. Okay, depends on the language there. The overlap between blockchain and engineers falsely believes logic can solve human disputes. That is an interesting thought, isn't it? That's what blockchain's trying to do. With Gen AI, it writes buggy code. Yes and no, that does happen. And with blockchain and Gen AI, massively overhyped. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that. And then the intersection of all three together is technically just a slow database. No, but good comment. I thought it was pretty funny. I laughed. This one I wrote, I to the I is the loneliest number, which of course, no, one is the loneliest number. There's a three dog night reference if you want. But this is the sort of math I used to do. I used to do in my job, but this is really simple actually. E to the I X is cosine of X plus I sine of X. That's just Euler's identity. And if you put in x is pi over 2, cosine of pi over 2 is 0 and sine is 1. So that is actually i. So e to the i pi over 2 is i. If you raise that to the i, then i times i is minus 1. So i to the i is e to the minus pi over 2. And the conclusion is i to the i is a real number. Which it is, although it's funny that it's a transcendental number raised to a transcendental number. I have no idea what any of that means. But I thought it was entertaining, so I included it in here. But again, that's the sort of math I used to do back in the day before, when I was a research scientist before I switched to this IT stuff. So it was an easy demo for me to follow. Okay, you can make a difference, right? So this cartoon from War and Peace said, Imagine a world without hunger, without suffering. Now imagine you can make that dream a reality. You have the power by opening a small can of tuna. You can make a difference today, right? So obviously the cat wants to be fed and it's a crisis for the entire world. Yes, I understand. This one was entitled Mouse Jiggling. I'd never heard of this. And it was based on a post on Mastodon from Scott Francis. It said, if you are tracking employees' mouse movements to see if they're working, you should just close up shop and go out of business because you are effectively paying them to move the mouse. I can barely conceive of a bigger failure of management than this. And I was like, what's that all about? And I remembered seeing some articles here. So I did a little Googling. The reference is to not just this article. I think there was one in The Verge. It's a little better. But the article was about Wells Fargo, the bank, firing a bunch of employees over mouse jiggling. What happened and what it said in this little summary article was, Wells Fargo, one of America's leading banks, has taken strict action against employees caught mouse jiggling to fake work. According to media reports, several remote workers were fired after allegedly simulating keyboard activity to give the impression they were actively working from home. Wells Fargo told the BBC it had strict standards and won't tolerate unethical behavior, when in reality, the unethical behavior is monitoring employees remotely to see if they're moving the mouse. That's just evil. That's just awful. And thinking that that had anything to do with being productive and getting the job done. Wow. Mouse jiggling. Apparently there are tools you can purchase that will automate that for you. Usually what those tools are used for, from what I understand, is to make it so a monitor doesn't go to sleep. But there are other tools to keep monitors from going to sleep as well. Okay, this one I thought was pretty funny. I've got several software architects I want to send this to. Post here says, software architecture, hot tips. Good things are better than bad things, except when they're not. Also, nothing is good or bad, okay? It depends. Yeah, that's a cliche there. The answer to every question is it depends, except for it doesn't. It depends. Name three things you like. You can't have them all at the same time. Then no. And then there are many definitions of software architecture, but none of them are correct. 
And there's no such thing as software architect. Yeah, I've definitely got some people to share that with. This one was great. Apparently, this is an invitation sent by Professor and Mrs. Tolkien for the coming of age of their son, Sub-Lieutenant C.J.R. Tolkien, R.N.B.R., so Reserve Navy or something like that. But the postscripts are what make the whole thing. Let's see if I can magnify that. It says, carriages at midnight, ambulances at 2 a.m., wheelbarrows at 5 a.m., Hers is at daybreak. Nothing like covering all the bases there, covering all the possibilities. This one I'm just going to show you and, and just walk away from. I don't want to get too political on my newsletter. Indictment cocktail, a white Russian beneath a thin orange skin and fake gold leaf garnish. Read into that what you will. Let's move on. And then finally, this old gag. Mac supporting Windows. Apparently, Mac supports Windows now, and the Mac's holding the window open, and somebody had written underneath. This joke pains me with that pun as well. So, of course, I had to end the Father's Day edition of my newsletter with a dad joke. So that was everything. Last week, I did have those three courses. It was fun teaching the AI tools for job developers one again, except I have way too much to fit into the course now, but that's good. This week, I just have week two of the spring and three weeks course, so I do hope to get another video made. One last check to see if that video was produced and the Aluma does. I appreciate your being here. I'll see you all next week. Take care.